Well, it's really a pleasure and an honor to be uh, up here at Harvard and to uh, talk to you about uh, some of the things that uh, we've been doing at the Well Connected Project of the Center for Public Integrity. And um, uh, I, I understand it's very interactive here, so I, I, won't, I won't talk for more than about 20 minutes uh, so that we can have the maximum time to talk about what, what you want to talk about. But um, I guess I, I uh, will we'll, we'll talk through some of the things that we've done with the Media Tracker, uh, one of the projects we, we have called FCC Watch, uh, <laughs> as well as some other initiatives in the realm of tracking telecom media and technology. So I wanted to start off by uh, hearkening back to 1934. Uh, that's, of course, when the Federal Communications uh, Act was passed and the FCC was established. Um, the, the FCC was preceded by the Federal Radio Commission, which was uh, itself um, a uh, independent regulatory agency created by Herbert Hoover. Um, in fact, um, uh, it's, it's interesting because Herbert Hoover, before becoming president in 1928, uh, you know, elected in 28 and 29, took office. He, he was Secretary of Commerce, and uh, he actually had a very significant role in some of the court decisions about the way airwaves were regarded or not regarded by the common law uh, courts. And he effectively tilted the scale uh, by de deciding how the government would treat these decisions towards an approach that called for maximum government involvement in the uh, radio space. Uh, and that, of course, was the mandate of the Federal Radio Commission to regulate all uh, transmissions, to reward licenses, and to uh, require the Licensees Act in the public interest. Now, in 1934, when the Federal Communications Commission was established, it joined the Federal Radio Commission together with authority over the Bell system. Uh, it was just one company, pretty much, then. Uh, that had been part of the Interstate Commerce Commission, but it moved over jointly in the FCC. And so for many years in parallel, you had effectively two sides of the FCC. You had the wired side, regulating AT&T, and the wireless side regulating radio broadcasters and then subsequently radio and television broadcasters. Well, obviously, the last couple decades have seen all kinds of challenges and changes to that. Uh, where does cable television fall? Is that by wire or by, by airwave or by something else? Uh, satellite, the introduction of satellites, uh, not only did that create questions about the rules governing content traveling over satellite, but also on the back end the issues of retransmission, uh, issues of um, uh, control, uh, whether satellite companies uh, could use the signals of cable systems to retransmit them widely over large parts of the United States. All of these questions that technological changes, even in those early days with cable and satellite and wireless, now, of course, with the Internet and with new generations of the Internet. All of these questions about how um, technology and our communications world are regulated are really front and center at the FCC. And it's still trying to figure out what it wants to be when it grows up. Um, so the FCC is what we watch. Uh, and I guess maybe the problem, to the problem that Colin asked, I'd say, well, who's minding the Washington watchers? Who's minding the net? who's minding our communications infrastructure. And technology has truly created this chessboard of corporate and government interests in telecom and media. And they're battling it out in Congress, at the FCC, in state houses, in international capitals. And what the Well Connected Project has done is track this inside influence game. So I want to start off by just walking you through the media tracker uh, so that you, you, you and those who are listening via cast can see a little bit more about it. Uh, this is all publicly available for free at publicintegrity.org slash telecom. And um, the first thing you see, of course, is the media tracker. So um, 
Let's take a zip code from somewhere outside of Boston. Who has one? 93103. Okay, 94306. Sorry, Doc. We do. We got some Californians here. So you type in your zip code, and what the media tracker is doing is it's aggregating large uh, sections of, of data. A 5 million record database is being assembled on the fly here. All of this is public information or, or information we've supplemented. And so we've released this information under a modified Creative Commons style license, which I'm also happy to talk about uh, for those of you who are interested in copyright and data and uh, the status of such. But anyway, so what you see here for Palo Alto is a summary of the media uh, in, in various forms in that community. Television, the number of licensed TV stations, radio, cable systems, <laughs> broadband providers, and newspapers. Um, obviously, the television, radio, and cable information we get from the FCC. Uh, broadband, I'll talk a little bit more about what we're not getting from the FCC. And the newspapers is, of course, not from any uh, government agency, because when I talked a little bit earlier about this question of, of the airwaves and was the airwaves going to follow, was it going to follow the, the telephone model, which was a common carrier model? Or was it going to follow um, a public interest model, which of course was the one chosen? Or would it be more truly a newspaper model? And again, these questions came all around again in 1996 when the Communications Decency Act was posed. Was the internet going to be treated as an electronic medium and regulated more intensively? Or as a print media and very free from regulations? Newspapers, of course, um, with the very interesting exception of newspaper broadcast cross-ownership are not regulated by the FCC. Uh, and that newspaper broadcast cross-ownership is, of course, a question that is now, once again, up back before the FCC. So I guess that's a long way of saying we don't get the newspaper data from the FCC. We go to a commercial provider who we've licensed the data from, and then we supplement it with our own data. So. Um, this here is just a linkage to uh, you know, mash up with the Yahoo map. Uh, we've put on, located here, the locations of the um, radio and, and television towers grouped by, um, by type, uh, AM, FM, uh, educational, commercial. And, uh, you know, I mean, this is a nifty little feature. You can actually see the towers by zooming in. But um, on a... On another note, you can see more about these different types of media. So let's start with television, this types of media and ownership of this media. So the media tracker has effectively three different views of the data of media and, uh, and policy. Um, the first is this view. We call it the zip code view. And here you see really a look up the channel dial in, uh, in, in, Cal in the city and, of course, every city in the United States. And what, we're, what we've assembled here is a map on the zip codes with the contour maps. Um, every station has a grade B radius that is on file at the FCC of where its signal is supposed to reach and it's not reach. And if that signal intersects with the zip code, we, we produce it here. Uh, and, and this is the licensee their home community, the network, the license type, and then we link it up to the parent owner. Uh, and this is not always obvious. We have to look at uh, uh, hundreds of 10K forms at the, S at the Securities and Exchange Commission in order to in ensure um, that we have these right. But what we, what we do is uh, link it to a company. So you want to see more about Hearst Argyle? Well, so now this is the company view of data. This is the ownership summary for Hearst Argyle Television. They have, of course, the TV and radio stations. And increasingly, you're seeing this, um, this uh, private privatization of public companies in the communication space. The cable companies were the first to go down this road, um, uh, you know, allowing them to, if they're able to leverage the funds, avoid um, the public scrutiny of the stock markets. But what I just p did is I popped up a level from the Hearst Argyle television to the, uh, the corporate 
the parent. Uh, and th so now you see this is the full facility information for all of Hearst Corp's television, radio, newspapers. If, we, if they had cable systems, we'd list them too. And this is just a, a geographical breakdown of where their stations are, station by station and radio station. Um, but now let me show you a little bit more about Hearst Corporation. So in addition to the facilities tab, we also have articles that we've written about this, uh, about this company. Um, the next phase of this operation is to effectively integrate this into a more uh, Web 2.0 uh, environment. We're, we're, we're definitely challenged in this regard. But the goal is effectively to make this a repository for news and information of a political and policy-oriented nature about Hearst. So you see the facilities, the profile, um, corporate data. We had it for the public company that was junior, but for the private company, they don't have it there. But now we have political influence. And this is, this is one of the key uh, value adds of the media tracker, is we, we collect from a variety of sources, sometimes directly ourselves from uh, the government agencies and sometimes through partners like the uh, Center for Responsive Politics, information about the political influence of Hearst. Uh, and this is um, a tracking of all of the contributions that employees of Hearst Corporation have given uh, to every member of Congress uh, who has run in the past 10 years. This is a more detailed listing of contributions than is available anywhere else to my knowledge. We actually list more detail than the Center for Responsive Politics from whom we, we purchased this data. Uh, but, but, but the key value here is, you know, you, you can see exactly who is contributing to an individual company. Uh, and of course, if you want to see who's receiving, um, you click on the third level of the media track or the, the congressman view or the member of Congress view, and you can see the individual and PAC contributions they've received from, from, from employees and companies in this sector, the telecom, media, and technology uh, sector. And we, br we, broad that, we define that as broadly as possible, precisely because of the convergence issues I was talking about at the start. If you want to analyze issues of media ownership, you need newspapers and movie studios in there that are the, frequently the parent owners of the, the networks. If you want to track network neutrality, you need to gauge the influence of an equipment provider like Cisco and an uh, internet uh, search company like Google. Uh, if you want to examine what copyright controls uh, are influencing debates, you certainly want Hollywood as well as the electronic companies money out there. And so this is what we've done here is we have a little pie chart so you can see an individual snapshot level who's um, the, the most generous, which sector has given the most to this particular member of Congress. Uh, Telecom, in large part, is above broadcast, but, but he uh, actually receives more from broadcast than your average um, member of Congress. And then, and then of course, um, you can view individual uh, contributions, just slicing the data another way. Instead of the company by member, this is members by company. And then uh, the trips they've received. Um, this is actually building off a prior a project of the Center for Public Integrity, Power Trips. Looks like he did. Members of his staff did not receive any uh, privately funded trips, although most members have. Um, so that's the different levels of the uh, the site. I want to go back to our zip code view and just show you a few more. Radio is very similar. Cable is uh, similar, but uh, it's not mapped in the same way. This is another FCC database, and it's taking the names of franchise uh, holdings uh, of a particular uh, company mapped to a physical location. Uh, and since there's a, some room for error there, it's not as precise as the database for the radio and television, we also include all registered cable communities in the county. Uh, and then again, you can click in through to any of these companies' views. Newspapers is great. If you want to know, if you want to see all of the newspapers that are published within 100 miles of a zip code anywhere in the country, go to this tab and you have a linkage to each of their websites. So 
you know, it's just a convenient location for all this information. Okay, the last thing I want to briefly mention about the media tracker here is the uh, broadband information. Um, one of the first things that I s saw needed improvement in the media tracker uh, when I joined the center um, in August of 2006 was to, to branch into broadband. And this really is the, the, the room, the, the biggest uh, area where we see room for growth. And I'd love to talk more about it with you all if you're interested in. But effectively, um, broadband is, of course, the new distribution method for all forms of media and telecommunications. And, you know, to some extent, the import, not to some extent, to a huge extent, the importance of broadcasting is diminished. I, I should, should emphasize, though, that broadcast enjoys a little bit uh, of an undue influence because a lot of the prerogatives that they had by virtue of being the spectrum holders are carried over to the cable world through retransmission consent. So even though only about 13% of Americans watch television over the air versus the you know, 87 or 88% that watch via cable or satellite, uh, the broadcast channels are still most viewed because they're, of course, on all cable systems because of those uh, retransmission and must-carry rules. But, but broadband, again, to come back to the point, is, is what's important. And I view broadband availability and competition and speed and service as being the most central issue in communications policy today because it influences net neutrality. If you don't have adequate competition, you're going to have a major debate over net neutrality. It, it impacts uh, issues of the digital divide, who's going to be connected and who's not to the forms of, of communications that are available. Uh, you know, it impacts questions of telephone service. I mean, there's a huge industry in Washington of telephone lobbyists that fight over this $8 billion pool of money called the Universal Service Fund that does not go to pay for broadband connections. Another little thing we can talk about if you're interested. It goes to pay for antiquated telephone service. Sometimes the rural phone companies are able to fudge it a little bit and say, oh yeah, we did do some DSL service from the the subsidies we got from universal service, but legally they're not allowed to take this USF subsidy they get and build broadband. So that's a long way of saying that it's important to see where these broadband providers are, especially if the FCC justifies its policies on the ground that there's lots and lots of competition out there. And the FCC does indeed say there are 17 broadband providers uh, in 94306. And so uh, um, is it uh, uh, Robert? Jason. Jason. Okay, do you believe there are 17 broadband providers in your home? Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's probably le somewhat less than 17. This is a list of all the people who file a particular form with the FCC claiming that they provide broadband service to any one person or business within that zip code. So it will include a lot of companies that just serve business, no doubt about it. Uh, what we did is we filed a Freedom of Information Act request to get this data on the grounds that, uh, you know, it's important public information for the citizens and consumers to be able to see who these 17 providers are, just like you can see who the television, radio, cable, uh, newspaper companies are. They have refused. Uh, we took them to court. Uh, we've gone back and forth. The FCC intervened, uh, sorry, the, the Bell companies, AT&T, Verizon, USTA intervened in, in the lawsuit. Uh, and we actually lost at the district court level, but the judge relied on some erroneous information that the FCC provided them uh, about um, so-called unique zip codes, uh, zip codes that are used by only a single entity, like 20554, which is the zip code used by the FCC. And so we filed a, a motion, a 53E, Rule 53E motion, sort of uh, clarifying this and asking for reconsideration. And we are still waiting to hear from the judge on that. Um, and who knows what will happen after that. I would certainly like to think that um, this will be uh, not just dropped, but continued and appealed. Um, of course, I hope they don't appeal if we win, but we'll, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. So this has been the media tracker. The other aspects of the Well Connected Project are the, um, the investigative reports we've done, uh, blogs, um, that blog entries that we've posted, news stories, and um, actually something completely off-site of the center that we are involved in 
is the um, Wikipedia, the Congresspedia wiki. Um, how many of you are familiar with Congresspedia? Okay, good, good crowd here. Um, we've worked with uh, the Center for Media and Democracy and the Sunlight Foundation, uh, who have been running this for some years now, the Congresspedia, and they wanted to build out a series of issue portals. I hope I'm getting connectivity here. A uh, series of issue portals on subjects. And um, if you just type in telecom, uh, you should be able to get uh, the portal. Obviously, like any wiki, this is editable by anyone. We have a list of all the topics that we have here. We built these out, seeded them, so to speak, with our reporters, copyright, broadband data, uh, um, Perform Act, patent reform, uh, and you know we're just sort of seeing what what happens. The difference with Wikipedia, of course, is that we're trying to keep it a little bit focused on policy, uh, keep it focused not so much on the general issue of digital copyright, say, but on the legislative issues that have come up around this space. And you'll see here this badge. This allows you to come right back to the center site by typing in your zip code. Again, we're happy to talk more about this uh, later. Well, I guess I promised to talk only 20 minutes, but I, I will extend for a few if you'd like to hear about FCC Watch. So that's what I'll talk about now. All right, so I started off with the problem that Colin posed and I answered is, who's watching the FCC? And we hope to answer, you know, we are. Uh, the, this is a site that is, is not yet public, but it is uh, it's something we've used for uh, investigative reports. Let me, in fact, just go to the report that we did on, on this. Um, so, all right, another quick check. How many of you have heard of the 700 megahertz auction? Okay, probably most, most of you have heard about it. It's been the big, I think it's the biggest FCC story this year, and it's really become a proxy for a lot of issues, including um, net neutrality, um, the competition debate, Carter phone for FCC regulatory uh, uh, administrative law uh, folks. Carter phone has kind of been given a new life in the wireless world because of uh, this issue. So the 700 megahertz uh, auction uh, provided us with a kind of a, a sample test case of who is lobbying the FCC. And the FCC, to its credit, has a system uh, called the um, ex parte filing system. And uh, I've, I've just started to look into this, whether other agencies do this. And, and the answer I tend to get is not really. But I, I'd really welcome your thoughts on this, because it's, it's a very valuable tool or it can be if you if you do something with it. As it is, there what happens is when there's a proceeding at the FCC, obviously there's a comment period and people file comments on this the record and then the FCC makes a decision. Of course it never really makes the decisions on the comments the way a court would make a, a decision on the, the pleadings. They make the decision based on the lobbying. They make the decision based on the ex parte filings. And so whenever an, an industry or a company or a nonprofit group or really anyone with an interest in a, in a proceeding comes and talks to by phone or in person with an FCC commissioner or, uh, or officer or employee, they need to file an ex parte form that is supposed to say in some degree of detail what they lobbied on and there's some degree of wiggle room there. But what we've done is we've built this database that uh, scrapes the ex parte filings every hour and gives a, uh, a summary <coughs> after we go through, a, again, a data intensive effort of coding the, the information into our database, who is, is lobbying a particular uh, commissioner. And so you see, um, you know, Jonathan Adelstein was the most lobbied of the five commissioners on this issue. Robert McDowell, second most. Um, but you can also see some of the most active members of staff and the most active lobbyists. Um, Frontline uh, Wireless was the uh, top uh, lobbying entity on this, followed, these are individual people, but uh, com among companies, uh, Frontline, I think, was followed by the uh, CTIA, the 
wireless association formerly known as cellular telecommunications and industry and internet association so what what you what what you see just kind of a peek behind the curtain a little bit this is uh this is a, a snapshot of the interface that that you have uh that we have been building a public interface on uh for who has filed uh most recently at the fcc and and you can see by date or more interestingly by organization so you want to see which organizations are lobbying on which issues name a company <laughs> they probably get the title for most improved lobbying organization <laughs> these are google's filings this year uh, we may have a couple in the last week or so off but uh, it's otherwise pretty complete um, you know conversation telephone call this may have been uh, Sergey Brin's, uh, no, Larry Page's call. Uh, he called Kevin Martin and said that timely and successful culmination of the pending TV white spaces proceeding is of considerable importance to consumers in the high-tech industry. And he explained in particular that digital televisions and wireless microphones can be amply protected from any harmful interference by unlicensed personal portable devices using reasonable power levels and sensing thresholds. Uh, and we link to the form that you can get. You can you can find this. It's buried on the FCC website. You know, you want to see what it looks like. I'll go ahead and open up another window here. But what's what's valuable now is you are able to sort through this. You can see, okay, this is what Larry Page has done. He called uh, Kevin Martin twice. Um, let's see what Kevin Martin's done. Um, well, he's had um, you know quite a few uh, meetings. And you can see, okay, well, who is he meeting with? Is he meeting with the Bells? Is he meeting with the public interest groups? Is he meeting with Google? You can measure them, track them, quantify them. Uh, municipalities, public safety agencies. You can see when he's meeting. Start to put these on a timeline. I mean, this is really just a, a structure that needs to be fleshed out. We need to integrate this into the kinds of interactive and and. I keep saying Web 2.0 tools. Maybe I should start saying Web 2.5 or Web 3.0 tools. But uh, that's really. Actually. Pardon? <laughs> Don't. All right. All right. Well, uh, Web negative 0.5. Um, but but the point being is that um, you know we need your help, right? We need to know how we can uh, how we can um, more nicely package what we're uh, dusting off and revealing to the public view here. So uh, I think with that, I will stop and open it up for questions. OK, Drew. Yeah, I, um, I work with the uh, Department of Telecom and Cable. OK. OK. Oh, great. I wish I knew about you guys. I've seen you seen, uh, like connection my research what uh, other states are doing. And uh, I think you would be just judging by looking at your face when I say the name of the yeah. that is. But but in fact what they got, they got a lot of good data when it comes to our job here. Like the maps are, are pretty impressive. Um, and I look at that though and I, I doubt that anyone will ever be able to get that kind of data again. Try me. Um, <laughs> so but clearly that's what you're going for. What do you think of the chances? Um, and then maybe on the more positive side of things, that it seems like things with FCC are trending towards uh, more granular data on broadband. That, that was that was what I gleaned. Like I said, most of my focus was on the state level, um, but I'd be interested to hear what they think of that. Sure, I'm, I'm, I've uh, had some interactions with Connect Kentucky, and uh, I. Uh, I uh, think there's a lot uh, there to what you've asked, and so. For those of us who don't know, could you just give us yeah. seconds on your connection? Absolutely. Right. So, um, Connect Kentucky is one of a variety of efforts to track broadband in some measure. Uh, on our homepage, uh, we have a report uh, in June uh, about some of the efforts we've been doing on the broadband front, uh, and you know, again, you can you can look at this, and this provides all of the legal filings in our our lawsuit, but it also summarizes the work of, of other organizations. And so I will tell you a little bit about Connect Kentucky. So Connect Kentucky, if I can spell, 
Um, Connect Kentucky has really gained a lot of traction in the last year. And um, I think that there's, there's some good reasons why. So Connect Kentucky is a state-led initiative. It's housed in a nonprofit organization, but uh, government officials were involved in setting it up. It's been around about five or six years, as I recall. And they started off being not about broadband, but about uh, getting technology deployed in communities that didn't have technological capabilities. So, I mean, as, as we're all aware, broadband is an issue uh, for this country. We're uh, 15th in the world in the international telecommunications ranking of broadband penetration. And so uh, we're beginning to see, and I think the center has contributed to this in some measure, a lot more debate about, well, how, how can you address this problem? One way is by getting better data about broadband. Now, Connect Kentucky has data about broadband availability. That's only one-fourth of the picture in my mind. Not only do you, do you need data about broadband availability, you need data about broadband competition, i.e., who are the other providers in your zip code or in your area besides the fact that there is a provider, who, what are the speeds at which the service is offered, and what is the price at which those services are offered. And you know, you can add on some other things, quality of service and so forth. And really, the next direction that uh, I'd like to head uh, with this effort is to build up from the ground up a, uh, a system for tracking broadband availability, competition, speed, and price. Now, there are a variety of initiatives out there. I've been in touch with a lot of them. I certainly welcome the opportunity to talk with with you about others. But the goal here is really to get people together to collect all of this information. Because while the availability is great, and I do applaud Connect Kentucky for the work they've done, it's just not going to be enough. Because it's not going to get at these other issues. It's not going to get at, well, is there really competition? Is What are the speeds? Is it anemic broadband? Or is it robust broadband? Or is it super fast broadband, which is really not available in many places? Perhaps Fios is the only uh, place there. And even that, you know, maxes out at 100 megabits a second until they upgrade the pawns. Well, the, let me back up. <laughs> New user, got the max. Uh, five. 5, 15, and 30 is what Verizon sells it at right now. Yeah. They claim the ability to go to 100 once the business case justifies it. And then the technology um, needs to be upgraded through a variety of back-end things to get it higher, uh, like the gigabit level like you see in Stockholm and many other places. Um, so what, uh, backing up, uh, what Connect Kentucky is doing is they started off being about getting technology available in, in areas like Kentucky that were less, less, um, less tech savvy. And they, they then gravitated towards, you know what? We're seeing that broadband is not available in a lot of these communities. And if you want people to be using the technologies, you need to have broadband. And so they, they basically said, we want to put together a map of, of where broadband is available. And so they go to the carriers, and they sign non-disclosure agreements with the carriers. And the carriers give them the date, as long as they don't publish who's, who's the where and why. And they do a map, which is, again, a great map of availability, but none, nothing else. Not, not competition, not speed, not price. Um, so there was another element I wanted to say there. Um, all right, I'm sorry. Uh, long answer to the question. Uh, I think that the, the, the chances of getting the data are good as long as you build it from the ground up. And if, if you are able to supplement it with data from this Freedom of Information Act, great. That just helps the legitimacy and helps provide a platform for people to add on. OK, sorry, Ethan. So one of the things that I marveled at in this presentation is how much data <clears throat> is already available. And you guys have done a brilliant job of making it accessible and searchable and so on and so forth. But I was sort of um, dumbstruck to discover that FCC commissioners are required to register every telephone call that they've had and every meeting it's they've the had. It's the companies and... that are required to register them. Interesting. OK. So I think what I'm curious about in all of this is in your field, and perhaps if you can broaden sort of beyond that, what are the data sets that you can't get that you're most excited about? 
you know, you've done some amazing things based on having some of these data sets available. What, first of all, in your specific work on sort of media and media ownership and FCC, do you most want? And if you can sort of broaden out from that, do you have a sense for what are sort of the crown jewels out there that should be available, should be mash upable, should be searchable, and aren't? And let me just sort of say that, that <clears throat> my, my, my perspective on all of this is, is always, I, I work in the developing world, I'm always amazed when I can find out who the parliamentarians are in Kenya, right? Like that's a huge step forward is that we actually now have lists of who all the members of parliament are. And if we get a little bit further, we might actually successfully figure out which of them graduated from high school. So the idea that you can actually find out that Larry Page made a phone call at a particular time is utterly mind blowing to me. So I'm, I'm <coughs> fascinated by that aspect of it. Well, thank you very much, Ethan, for your, your, your comments there. Um, so I'll, I'll give you four answers. The first data that I want that I don't have is broadband competition, speed, and price. And obviously, we wouldn't get the price and the speed even from this Freedom Information Act lawsuit that we're pursuing, but we would get the competition, right? Uh, and then obviously, that can be supplemented by users. Um, but there's another data set that I'm, I'm actually very anxiously chopping at the bit at, and I, I must admit I'm not 100% up to speed on whether the uh, the lobbying reform bill that passed Congress just a couple months ago, whether it ended up re requiring the quarterly reporting or not. I, I know there was some dis dispute in the House and Senate, and I, I don't have the latest on that. If someone else knows, does anyone else know? know? The, the, the thing that, that we're missing on the lobbying end is more detailed reporting about the congressional lobbying, right? I mean, so you got some good c current lobbying on the agency. And we do have, we have lobbying forms as to what companies are spending, and they, they also list the issues that they're filing on. But that's, uh, again, a very intensive process to go through. If we could get that quarterly or even monthly or even weekly, or you, know, that you start to get a real-time sense of not just the money, mm -hmm. but the money and the issues together. Because that's what's important. It's not just, OK, that X company spent this much money. Yes, of course. We know that they've got a lot of money, and they're willing to spend huge amounts of money because policy decisions depend, uh, affect their, their, balance, their bottom line greatly. But to be able to see, OK, so what issues are they pushing with that money? The two other things I'd say is, similarly on the state side, is to be able to replicate this data set. And, and the center. Um, uh, and this project, prior to my joining it, has done a lot of work on the state transparency mm -hmm. that I haven't had a chance to, 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 to go and, 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 and redo or duplicate. Uh, but, but then the next step is the international one. Yeah. And that's, that's definitely good. I mean, just put aside Kenya, uh, Ethan. I mean, just like, let's get some lobbying disclosure in Europe, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that's, that's a real, another great opportunity. And love to talk more about you what's going to make that happen. Let's get back to Kenya, right? Because, I, I mean, what's really interesting to me in all of this is when people are not just lobbying, but are actually passing envelopes of money under the table. I, I mean, one of the campaigns you may be aware of out there is Publish What You Pay, <coughs> um, which basically just goes out and says, look, we all understand that in the oil industry, to get oil contracts, we bribe people. We just want to know who's bribing who and how much. And <coughs> it's fascinating to sort of stand up and sort of say, we all understand that you know this system is essentially based on bribery and not the sort of you know soft bribery of yes Ted Stevens got a trip to Disneyland for eight hundred and sixty five dollars that I looked up, but literally like writing you know multi million dollar checks that say that you know suddenly you're able to do business. Well that is that is great, Ethan. What I, I, I just realized there is what you can do is by by going to the Kenya and to, uh, Kenya and all these other countries, you can then collect back the company level information and you can collect the company level information back and sort of fill in the dots on mm -hmm. globally what the companies are doing. So, so right. that would be, it would be excellent, fascinating to excellent idea. Yeah. John wants to go ahead. Just to follow on Ethan's <laughs> sure. line of thinking and actually channel my friend and colleague Jonathan Zittrin, who were he here, and perhaps he is somewhere in the ether, um, uh, might be uh, asking a question about a research project that we've had long on the back burner, but hopefully will be on the front burner soon. Um, the idea is to do a distributed application for research let people download, and we have an uh, alpha version of this, but um, download onto your PC a um, non-badware, non-spyware tool um, in the first instance, which uh, might test for whether you have spyware and so forth on there um, for distributed research projects. 
transporting back to a mothership. Um, we're looking at it for our internet filtering project as a way to, particularly for people in the field, to be able to say, um, is the site that I am going to or care about in a certain place censored here or elsewhere? Um, but the third thing we've thought about is whether or not you could test broadband speeds. Excellent. You could have a deployed base, and I mentioned this as a follow-on to Ethan, mainly because if our interest is having it around the world, um, you know, an easy way to do it is get users to potentially with us and then to report back to um, very specific information. I wonder if you think that um, a distributed application of that sort could be helpful for the stuff that you're doing, and, and what would it collect if um, it were uh, uh, excellent. That's that's why I'm up here is to, to learn from from uh, efforts like this, um, and I I am aware of a variety of of uh, organizations, both businesses and and nonprofit, that are that are doing stuff with speed tests, and that's that's absolutely where I'd like uh, uh, to go with 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 broadband tracking. So one of them is the E Corridors Project at Virginia Tech. And I've been in touch with them and uh, working with them on, on the next version of, of uh, broadband monitoring. They use uh, a particular speed test, open source NDT tool. I don't know if, if that's part of what, what, what um, you've, you've contemplated. And I believe this is the same tool that um, CADA at University of California, San Diego has, has contemplated using. Uh, and and this, this, you know, it's focused on Virginia right now. But, but when you track broadband with the speed test, you, f you find out a lot of information. You, and obviously, you've got to be very clear about what you're collecting and, and why you're collecting it. And that's, that's absolutely crucial. Um, but but it's, it's, it's the precisely the way you can start to get uh, information, distributed information collected. Now, what eCorridors is finding is they're finding a very uh, close match to um, you know broadband availability and you know the number of providers that that are listed on the uh, FCC forms. So, for instance, you know you can go down to uh, Blacksburg here and see information about uh, each of these connections. Um, this is uh, a particular location, Ambler Johnson. Uh, provider is Virginia Tech. Um, let's check out another one here. Um, anyway, I won't, I won't take more time to do this. Uh, I will mention that <coughs> Communications Workers of America has a speed test called speedmatters.org, and they also get, get that information. They don't, they don't yet publish it. They publish speeds. You see, they're taking it one step further. They've got the, the, the availability and speed but they're not doing the competition and the price. So it's putting all four of these pieces together in the puzzle, and there are a lot of people out there who are thinking about this, and I, the global, global dimension is something that um, is, is definitely something I've been aware of, and, and it, it does have natural tie-ins to the ability to monitor filtering uh, and censorship, and of course, you know, port blocking and net neutrality issues as those arise not only in this country but, but overseas. Um, Doc. Going back to um, your first um, item that you demonstrated with the with the tabs that have all the different media across the top, so forgive me if I don't remember the media guy. tracker. Okay, yeah. so uh, and if you go back to to that zip code or wherever, the I was noticing as I looked through radio, for example, you don't have say translators in there, um, and I'm thinking, is, is your system open to having hackers among your readers help you? Um, scaffold together some of the additional data sources and automate that because uh, I know like for example um, uh, MIT has or people around MIT have something called radiolocator.com that has yeah. that includes the translators and what they cover like relevant Santa Barbara for example all the public TV all the public radio comes to translators and um, and they have a lot of listeners and their towers are you know the but they're they, they're missing on your database and they have influence you know so anyway but it, the question really has to do with how open your system is to help from the outside. Yeah, no, great question. I was aware of this translator issue, and and um, you know the the unfortunate answer is uh, we're not there yet, but we're trying to get there, <laughs> and that's that's definitely a direction that I think w 
you know this project needs to go in because a it's thing, it, right? exactly that's yeah. the only way you're going to successfully collect broadband information and likewise it's a way to fill in the gaps and the holes of, of all this other information I mean you do sometimes need to make certain assumptions and uh, decisions about about okay we include this or we don't include this when you're when you're taking data and and uh, I, I guess what I mean by that is you want to be able to say okay this is this is a uniform uh, policy you've applied and for whatever reason translators didn't make the cut or low power uh, television or weekly newspapers don't make the cut but that doesn't mean you can't have start to have it sort of like a, a two-level system this is data we have vetted and checked mm -hmm. and this is what kind of everyone's telling us that we haven't gotten double double confirmation on and I think that's really where where this this project uh, the broadband tracking and increasingly journalism in general needs to go you need to have kind of an open open friendly front page where this is we're we're like totally as certain as we can be 99 percent sure and this is stuff hey this is what you're telling us and we're not 100 percent sure about this but we think it's worth putting out there i think this is the first time i've heard of this it's very interesting so is this global is it do you just sort of remain within confines of what is u.s or can i just google in an iraq zip code or something and you know yeah, it's not global yet. I mean, th th there's there's a, a long-standing goal to take the project more globally, um, and I think broadband is really the way to start that. I mean, just like John was saying, because you almost have a kind of a common protocols, common things you could test for. You just need to find the analog for the zip code in in England or Kenya or wherever, and be able to enable searching that way. But I mean, you have such different regulatory frameworks for broadcasting, for cable, et cetera. But for internet, at least, there's some common technological. And to Ethan's platform. point, you need something to search on, whether yes. it was user generated. Or <coughs> yeah, that's right. Well, uh, I think in that sense, what's interesting about this is <clears throat> the extent to which this site can show, as much as you're going to hate this, an exemplary policy as far as you know public disclosure of data. Right? You couldn't build these tools if this data was not available. And what's interesting is showing how much data is available on broadcast and uh, on broadcast TV and radio allows you to then make the case and say, why the heck isn't it available on cable and on, uh, on broadband? What's very, very interesting at that point is that you can then sort of hold this up and say, hey, government of Ghana, you have a lot fewer licensed providers. Why can't you provide this data? This is important data for people to understand what's going on. This is important data that responsible governments require to be reported so that people can make intelligent yeah. decisions and then sort of hold this up as an exemplar and try to get people to, to align with those policies. Yeah. And I think it's also worth putting out the marker for how this affects other parts of the economy, right? I mean, you know, what other agencies are there out there that are doing this and have ex parte systems or other government, uh, other governments around the world when, when you have political players together, I think, again, the, the principle being one of disclosure. This is actually sort of a question for JP, although. Um, um, has ONI considered putting its bit of software, which could do your work as well, um, in, into uh, into Google tools? I mean, obviously Google would have to make yeah. it a opt-in box, but uh, <clears throat> and. Uh, yeah, I mean, so one of the long-running conversations with the <coughs> Open Initiative, which for those who don't know, is our study, study to track censorship around the world. And it's, Place we find it online censorship um, is right now we do only what we think of as gold standard research. We use very um, clandestine, in some cases, um, measures to test from within countries and um, uh, it's fairly high spy and careful and protective of the people involved. Um, and uh, we sort of control those data, massage them, get to the place where we're confident of reporting. In this instance, the review is 99%. And one of the questions is how and when. Can we make a version of our tools available to let other people run it and then say, we don't vouch for these data, it's not the gold standard, it's just what you somebody might come to know. So the primary effort of this sort is um, we've had two tracks of development going, one by a student at MIT and one um, uh, more um, professionally done um, uh, that is 
um, meant to do roughly this. It, we hadn't thought of it as a, um, in the Google context, although, although we could. Um, but this is what we call the distributed application um, project. And there would be two versions of distributed application. One would be one that anybody could use anytime. And you'll just be running on your machine and, and get a sense of, with a best guess, why something was blocked. Um, and then the second one would be, could we use that actually as a way to do the core ONI research? I think the instinct of the principal investigators is not yet that we can't get enough data from that that we um, that we can trust and report on. Um, but I would love to see in the next months, not years, um, some sort of tool like this deployed. And um, I'm hopeful that we can do it. And frankly, Ethan and others have been pushing this for some time very helpfully to get us um, uh, in this direction. So if something like that were to happen, or even if it were, um, would it I guess it's actually just a marketing question. Would it make sense to try to bundle some of your uh, needs into? It was exactly my question. Okay. Was to say, and one of the one of the things <coughs> we've been doing is giving people, in essence, an application that would have three checkboxes. Right. One checkbox is PC help. Tell us yep. to stop bad work. Connection. The second is um, bundling in the sensory wire stuff, yep. and the third would be the net neutrality stuff. That's <coughs> been the, the grand idea. Yes. Um, I sort of have a little bit of a continuation of Ethan's question in a more primitive way. Um, you know, and I understand that, you know, in Kenya, they feel comfortable with it, they give rights, but, you know, the civilized, I don't, and I don't know how long it's been available, but the civilized Europe that considers themselves a democracy, you know, how do they look at it and say, we don't have anything similar to that? Or have they looked at it? Well, um, uh, I actually have a, um, a former colleague and friend uh, named William New, and I know he was through here yeah. just recently, and he has uh, Intellectual Property Watch right, right in front of me there. He's doing something like this from a journalistic sense of watching uh, the intellectual property industry in Geneva. And of course, Geneva is really an international center as opposed to Brussels, which is the European center. But he tells me that you know they're way behind, too. And and so this is this is both a kind of a journalism effort and a uh, citizen data a effort, uh, and it's going to involve the kinds of uh, sunlight foundations, the uh, the Wikipedia types. I mean, to to really push in many ways. Now, I mean, you I mean, you know, you asked a question, why don't they? And I just I simply don't That's have the why, answer for why that. Why don't they? But how do they? I don't know how long it's been available. But if they look at it and they consider themselves democracy, and not yeah. the country that takes bribe openly. You know, how could they possibly, I don't understand the mentality of looking yeah. at our democracy is lesser than yours. Yeah. That's a pretty good indication well, of it. I think one point that's worth making here is that one thing that all sides of the campaign finance uh, debates agree on is that disclosure is good. Right. I mean, people who want tighter rules, who wanted McCain, Feingold, perhaps want new rules on the so-called 527 groups, and those who take a different view that it's really not worth it to try to control this money in politics because there's always going to be some other way it gets in. The only thing you can do about it is require disclosure. So that's one principle that kind of two diametrically opposing sides agree on in this country is that disclosure. And I think that comes from very strong traditions of, you know, First Amendment free press, um, but also a sense of, 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 you know, let me put it this way. Um, we don't necessarily think that we have a privacy right against someone publishing information about us in this country. Like, like legislators in Europe, I know because I've talked to them, say, oh, well, I have a privacy interest in the the data that I do as a legislator, and, and I'm just going, what are you talking about? You're a public servant. You know, your data is, your your life is a public life. And and so there's a little bit of a disconnect. It has to do with kind of privacy versus disclosure. Um, so I, I, maybe that's just a hint at, at, at some of the different mind uh, world views and mindsets that are uh, creating this. But But I think, you know, as we're more globalized, we're more interconnected, I think they're going to go towards the, the open society model, the open disclosure model. Drew, the um, Center for Public Integrity is a remarkable but <coughs> relatively unique organization. And most investigative journalism in the past has been done by newspapers. And as newspaper circulation declines and revenues decline, they're trimming staff and investigative is expensive. That's usually the first thing that goes. I know that the funding that comes for CPI is, is 
primarily grant funding. There's no advertising. You're not going out and seeking sponsors to do this work. Is that the model for creating smaller other CPIs? Is there another way to sort of take this database investigative journalism into public interest and, and, and start doing it in other places? Well, let me offer two reactions on that. The first one is to say, you know, you're certainly correct that doing data-based journalism, doing computer-assisted journalism does require an expenditure that you need some, you know, capital, some investment to do. And the center has clearly played that role, as have other large newspaper organizations. The New York Times has an excellent team of computer-assisted reporters, as does the Washington Post, as do, you know, um, a variety of, of papers in Florida that I'm aware of and elsewhere. Um, so, yes, it does require an investment, and yes, you're right that people are very wary about whether newspapers will continue to be able to make that investment. Um, the founder of the Center for Public Integrity, Chuck Lewis, has actually just written an article in CJR about the nonprofit model for journalism and investigative journalism, where he promotes the nonprofit approach. And I think there's a lot of legitimacy to that. The second point I would make, though, is that just, I mean, this is kind of a uh, wealth of networks point, right? I mean, the, what used to be the theory of the firm and the optimal economical size for an entity is, is in many ways blown apart by the models of collaboration that the internet enables. And so, you know, your firm that acts as an entity uh, was once kind of geographically fixed and located, and that's just, I mean, what is Wikipedia? I mean, that is a that is a weird sort of firm, but it, but it is. It is acting in some kind of concerted common effort, and I would like to see more effort put into getting bloggers to work together to pool resources, even if it's just collaborative resources, that can get them doing this kind of stuff, because I am very pessimistic it about... Be called Global Voices. There you go. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, I'm very pessimistic. I, well, I don't say pessimistic. I'm optimistic that <coughs> newspapers will not be around in 20 years. I think that I think that you know it's kind of like all right, let's say taps and move on. I mean, journalism is going to go on. Newspaper journalism is going to go on, whether it's printed on dead newsprint is not really a material question. And so, what becomes of journalism? I think it you know now is a very exciting time for journalism because you have you know, low entry bars to get started, but to do good stuff, we have to think creatively and work collaboratively and in, in some new ways. And so, I, I don't know, I, I don't want to take on uh, the future of newspapers is irrelevant um, question precisely, <laughs> but maybe the, the flip side to a bunch of questions that have been asked, including David's, is so how does this work now? Uh, how is the word getting out there? Who's accessing the, the, these great data sets? Yeah. Amazing tools. We did an event with Sunlight in January that was around sort of tools like this, so the intersection of technology uh, and politics and policy. And what we saw were a host of amazing tools, some really geeky and impenetrable, others uh, prettier, but still, and, and uh, Congress PD is one of them, but still you wonder why this stuff isn't, or you wonder whether uh, it's making it into the mainstream consciousness. And if it's not, how do we get it there? What's the missing ingredient? Because clearly you can, I mean, I'd never heard of the, you know, the FCC, or the corporate filing group, with yeah. respect to FCC calls, it's usually interesting. Can I just tack on the end of comments, which yeah. you might not respond to, but Doc had the blog post earlier today advertising and talked and you linked what you're doing to Larry Lessig, what I'm going to do for the next 10 years. I think <laughs> one of the big questions, at least for me, listening to this, following on from Collins is, um, in addition to our other people accessing it, is why is it making a difference? Yeah, right. I mean, the question is, would anybody here raise their hand and say, we have a great telecom policy in the United States? Probably not that many of us, right? Um, and maybe it's better than the Ghanaian one, if we even didn't really qualify to do this analysis. But there is sort of a question of, um, OK, great. Transparency is good. Disclosure is good. So is apple pie. So is openness. So you know, um, are we actually doing something about it in a level of some sort of sense? Yeah, it's a good, good question, uh, Colin and John. I mean. The difference, the difference question is always a hard one to, to tackle, um, but, but I, I, think, I think the answer really just comes down to, you know, do, do, do you live in a world where you can investigate uh, and, and know what's going on about, about you? And um, I mean, you know, we can, we can argue about different policies and the import of different policies, but 
but I think that that you know what the internet and the internet's evolution over the last two decades shows is that you know, it has had a huge impact, and I think that the internet's been able to have this kind of open openness style impact by virtue of the philosophical ideals of of transparency, you know, this notion of disclosure I was talking about earlier. I mean, I mean, I know we're sort of talking a little bit of um, mixed fruits here, but but I think that that the notion of of openness that I know is central to Berkman and central to the internet is is the same notion uh, that 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 our constitutional ideals of freedom of, of expression, freedom of speech. Uh, the 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 ability to petition for grievances are 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 built upon. So I mean, I guess sort of is it making a difference? Well, in the biggest sense of things, yes. Maybe in the little marginal things, not yet. I mean, as to the practical question, I mean, we're trying to get the word out as well as we can about the, this database and other initiatives that um, uh, are worthy of pursuing, like this this notion of broadband tracking in a really robust way. I want to continue this conversation with. With, with all of you about that and how we get these tools out there. And yeah, maybe maybe it is working with people who have, at some point, with people who have real muscle like Google, right? I mean, you get something in Google. I mean, that's that's what people, that's where the news is, right? I mean, you know, back to our bomb question. Yeah. Oh, wait, uh, there's also possible. There's a last, last question that we have to let okay. people kind of break up into it there. There's also a wealth of possible news. I mean, Google stuff would be great, of course, but. Uh, there's also a wealth of possible news in going up a level, in looking at all the data that you've acquired and sort of pointing out to people what the significance of it is, that Comcast owns this percent and of, of stations and that percent of, lobby, of, of Congress's time or the FCC's time. Yeah. So um, if you did that, if somebody, anybody could go in and do that work, but you're in a very good position to do it yourself. And, and uh, There's news in that, too, I think. I agree completely, and that's that's definitely what this is designed to do: is to enable us and other people to go and do that kind of analysis. Okay, Comcast gave this much, lobbied this much, occupied this much of the telecom time, got this many votes on these issues. That's what the congressional uh, issues will be, uh, enable a lot more fine analysis of: is which con which member which companies are pushing which particular bills, um, and I think um, the first. The, the, the point I wanted to con conclude on, if I could, is that, um, you know, what constitutes your front page is different now than it was 10 years ago. And what I meant by my comment about newspapers is that, um, you know, there are, there are different sorts of front pages emerging out there. Google clearly has a very valuable front page. But I don't think it's the only front page. I think there are other ways that front pages will arise. I mean, RSS is a form of a front page. Uh, data aggregation tools that Sunlight's putting together and are making available to all kinds of journalism and non-journalism organizations. So they're another type of front page that organizes your world in some way that um, you know you want to make sense of. And um, and again, I. I, I I, I think that, that journalism has a very bright future. Uh, it, it is clearly a very different future than it's had over the last uh, couple decades. So with that, um, please join me in thanking Drew for our great lesson. Thank you.